Lord, we invite you this morning by the power of your spirit to open up your word to us. We pray, Lord, it will be our source of joy and strength. And Lord, in these troubled times, we would see that you are God, you are king. This is your world. You made it and you sustain it. You are a loving God, a merciful God. And for that, we give you praise, honor, and glory. And Lord, I pray anything else on our mind this morning will just fade away as we focus on you and your worthiness to be praised. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. Most all of us have had times when our children came running into the house, excited or out of breath, or, or something had gone wrong, or something just amazing had just happened, and they're out of breath talking fast, like I just did. And you couldn't make heads or tails out of what they were trying to get conveyed to you. The only thing to do was to ask them to calm down and start from the beginning. Now, with my kids, they're both smart Alex. They would have said, okay, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, no, not that beginning, not that far back. But once the story unfolds, you more fully understand the situation, and you can make a better decision as to what to do. Last Sunday in our, in our Christmas Eve service as well, we considered the story of the birth of Christ from the perspective of Luke, the gospel writer. We saw that Luke taught using contrast. For example, he, he showed the contrast of the response between Jack, Zachariah and the response of the Virgin Mary. Both have been talked to, have been approached and announced uh, something major is going to happen from the angel Gabriel, but there's two very different responses of faith. Luke was also unique among the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and John. And that he told the story from the perspective of the humanity of Jesus, like from the ground up, if you will. His story enables the reader to see how Jesus came to us in the same way that we entered life, through the womb of our mothers. Luke wonderfully pointed out that the Christ child was born in humility to a teenage mother and a blue-collar father. He was the promised king of Israel, and his first throne room was a stable, and his first throne a feeding trough for animals. We read how an, how an angel of the Lord came to the shepherds, announcing the birth of the Christ child, and, and the heavenly host showed up singing praise and honor and glory to God because of the birth of this baby. What were the heavenly hosts which the, the armies of God so excited about? The word host in the Greek is actually army. This is a band of soldiers. This heavenly army announced peace. The peace only comes after the enemy has been vanquished. And God's army announced peace implies that the peace being referred to is to be the end of his hostility between God and man. In addition, the restoration of the kingdom of God under Christ would include inner peace and peace between men. How could the angels know this? And why were they so excited and joyful? The answer is that the angels knew who this child was and what it would mean for all creation. We should consider the implications of the restoration of creation. Paul writes in Romans 8, 19 and 21, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In addition, a return to peace with God, a vanquishing of the enemies of God, means that the angels themselves will also be at peace and can return to being God's messengers and the servants of man. They had every reason to rejoice at the birth of the child. There's an exceptionally good reason for us to join with the angels, singing praises to God for the birth of Jesus Christ. Luke started his gospel by focusing on the humanity of Jesus. And he begins, John begins by focusing on the divinity of Christ. You see, it's not a story of what the child was to become, but what he has always been and always will be. That's the mystery of the gospel, of what God would do on our behalf. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which is called the Synoptic Gospels, 
They tell the story of Jesus from a similar perspective, but John does as many stories that John does not include in his gospel because they've already been told by the other three. But towards the end of John's gospel, he gives the reason for his writing it in John chapter 20, 30 to 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him you may have life in his name. This story is simply about God, the glory of his character, the nature of his life, and his desire to share that life with his creatures. It's about God come amongst us and the mixed response he received to his offer of divine life. John does not gently ease us into the story by leading us into the situation at hand at that time when he was born. Instead, he plunges us immediately into the heart of the revelation of who it is that has come for us. At the beginning, he was preparing his readers for the themes that would enable them to see the, the rest that was coming in his gospel from the perspective of who it was that came. From the beginning, there was no doubt as to the identity of Jesus. So let's begin with John chapter 1 and read verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The beginning that John is referring to is not the beginning of creation that we read about of the, new, of the heavens and the earth that we read about in Genesis 1. The beginning that John refers to is eternity, a concept that you and I cannot comprehend. With us, all things have a beginning and an end, and they're measured in time and space. But God is not bound up by those things. He created them for us. He's not limited. He's eternal. So the first thing that John shows us in the beginning, the word was. Simple as that. Before anything else happened, the word existed. The word was. He was the eternally existing one. He was in the beginning with God. This is one of the most profound verses on the Trinity in the Bible. And it makes a distinction of persons in the essential unity of the Godhead. The Word was not only with God, but He was God as well. And it was through this Word that all things were created. And since creation is a function and activity of God, the Word was understood as being God. John knew that in order to understand the identity of Jesus, we must first begin with the relationship that He had always had with the Father before the world had begun. And the thing about truth is that it's always true. Our enemy always seeks to provide a counterfeit that sounds a lot like the truth, but it's not. It's a lie. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1, 18 and 19, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. This idea of God being eternal, we cannot conceive of it, but that does not make it untrue. It's the very thing we hope for, that God is greater than we are. He's not like us. Can I hear an amen to that? <laughs> At the time that John's writing this gospel, the concept of the Word of God as God was already there. Jewish rabbis referred to God in terms of His Word. They spoke of God himself as the Word of God. For example, ancient Hebrew editions of the Old Testament changed Exodus 19.17, where we read it, it says, So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded them. But they changed it to Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet the Word of God. In the mind of the ancient Jews, the phrase, the Word of God, could be referred to as God Himself. But also the Greek philosophers, long before that, 
They saw the word, the logos is the word in Greek, as the power that puts sense into the cosmos, the world, making the world orderly instead of chaotic. The logos was the power that set the world in perfect, perfect order and kept it going in perfect order. They saw the logos as the ultimate reason that control all things within the cosmos. So when John uses this opening to his gospel, he was pointing to Jesus as the true and living Logos, the true and living Word. For centuries, Jews and Greeks, their philosophers had been referring to the Logos in their conversations and their writings. And so now John is writing about Jesus in a way that they can understand as the fulfillment of all that they had hoped for. And James Montgomery Boyce puts it this way. Everything that can be said about God the Father can be said of God the Son. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In Jesus dwells all the wisdom, the glory, the power, the love, holiness, justice, goodness, the truth of the Father. In him God the Father is known. So to fully grasp, grasp the identity of Jesus as the agent of God in creation, it needed to be perfectly clear that God had used him and John writes, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, which is, refer is, is more proof of the divine nature of the word. And John 5, 26 says, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. Life as we know it emanates from the word, our creator. But he's also the light of men, which points back to creation, where the light dispels the darkness in Genesis 1, 2, and 4. John 1 introduces the beginning of the new creation and the, and the light that exposes and defeats the present darkness coming through the living word. God the Father is viewed as throughout the gospel as the ultimate source of it all, including the Son and the Spirit. But God, the light did not simply come through the Word, but was in the Word. Only God is the source of life. And it's a mark of Jesus' distinctiveness and the deity that the Father has granted the Son to have life in himself. He emphasizes this with no exceptions. Everything was created, was created by the living word. All things came by this word. In his commentary on, on the Gospel of John, Dr. Rod Whitaker writes this. Although with verse 3 we move from eternity to creation, we're still dealing with facts hard to comprehend. Until discoveries made in the 1920s, the Milky Way was thought to be the entire universe. But we now realize there are many billions of galaxies. Science is helping us spiritually, for it silences us before God in wonder and awe. But this verse also helps us to put science in its proper place. The universe is incredibly wonderful. How much more wonderful must be the one upon whose purpose and power it depends? The builder of the house has greater honor than the house himself, according to Hebrews 3. This is a very different emphasis than the one chosen by Luke. But both are essential to understand the identity of Jesus Christ, the Word who became flesh. To some of the ancients, gods were thought to visit at times in human likeness, but to others, the spiritual and divine were totally opposed to matter and to flesh, which was considered inferior. We make a good case for that, don't we? Now, John was proclaiming that the one true and living God actually became flesh and had chosen to dwell in the midst of his creation as a created one. No one saw that coming. This offended many who could not accept as truth that God would demean himself by living as humans, as a human. And certainly God would not allow himself to become self-limiting by his humility, his humanity. By choosing to take on flesh, Jesus could, by necessity, have to deal with the problems and the limitations of the flesh. In Luke 4, 9, Satan tempts Jesus to jump off the temple because Psalm 91, 11, and 12 said that the angels would not allow the anointed one to even strike his foot upon a stone. But Satan knew another truth. 
He knew that in his humanity, Jesus Christ was not going to jump off a building and fly. He needed, like everyone else, the protection of his heavenly Father. And so he rebuked him, not, being, not trying to prove himself because he knew who he was in God. No one saw that coming. And no one interpreted the prophets to foretell such a thing. Who would want a God that looked like us, that lived among us? Most people are more comfortable with the idea of God. He's up there somewhere looking down on us, but not living among us, but caring for us from afar. One of the most compelling aspects of this is that the Jewish followers of Jesus believed that he was both God and man. Judaism taught them there was only one God and that no human was divine. Yet they had encountered the God-man and had lived with him, not only seeing the miracles and feeling the power of his love and of his presence, but because there was no other way to understand his teaching. If he was telling the truth, then he had to be who he said he was. He was not teaching them that there were multiple gods, but there was a divine trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Son had come that we might know the Father through him and be filled with the Spirit, just as he was at the day of his baptism. And no one saw that coming either. The Gospel of John is a great source of teaching on the triune God who in this oneness manifests himself in three separate yet distinct persons. In John 14, Jesus declares he's the only way to the Father, but he's going to send the Spirit to comfort and empower those who follow him. We affirm this teaching every week when we say the Nicene Creed. The scriptures emphasize the general distinctions between the works of the three persons, the Father initiating, the Son complying, and the Spirit executing the joint will of both. Total harmony, total peace between them. We must pay equal attention and give honor to all three persons while always remembering that we worship one God in these three persons. In all of John's gospel, his, his primary focus is on the, the divinity of Jesus and the unity of the Godhead. And there's one part that I want to focus on this morning in the time that's left, and that's going to be found in John 1, 10 to 13. Let's turn to that. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God came to the same world that he created, to the creatures that were made in his image. And yet the world didn't know him. They were not looking for someone like him. This shows how deeply fallen human nature is without God when it rejects him. And that many reject God and the light he brings. They prefer the darkness. Only Jesus can dispel that. He came to his own, even the very nation that were the people of God. We might say that Jesus came home. When the word came to this world, he did not come as an alien. He came home to the world and to the people that he created, but how was he received? Those who were looking for the Messiah did not receive him. In Luke 20, verse 14, the parable of the wicked tenants, it says, but when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let's kill him, so that the inheritance may be ours. Jesus was pointing to those who should have known him as those who were going to kill him. And his point was this. It was not that they would kill him because they didn't know him. It's because they did know him that they killed him. They did not want a king like him. They did not want a carpenter's son, a traveling teacher, or one who exposed their treachery and godlessness. They wanted a warrior king 
who would vanquish Rome and establish Israel as the dominant nation, the mighty nation. And the one thing that was a characteristic of Jesus' ministry was the rejection of those to whom came, he came initially. It's not the ones who consider themselves righteous, but the ones who were drawn to Jesus, but it was the ones who knew they were not. Jesus is pointing out that human beings are not children of God by nature. This is often a misunderstanding by many. Even though we're all made in God's image and everyone still reflects that image to some degree, that does not make God the Father. He makes him the creator. It will be those who receive Jesus as the only hope for salvation and a sa as Savior and Lord who will be given the right to become children of God. John points out that it's not because of human birth, flesh, or blood, but because of the sovereign and gracious action of God without denying the human response in believing and receiving. What is being offered to those who will surrender is extremely intimate and extremely personal. I think we can become so used to the verbiage of giving our lives to Christ that we miss the actual invitation that God has given to us. And by extension, we, we miss the deepest meaning. Often when we think of committing our lives to Jesus Christ, we see that as eternal security, like a fire insurance, and a guaranteed ticket to the new heavens and the new earth. But that's a very shallow concept of what God has offered to us in Jesus Christ. What he has given those who receive him and believe on his name is the right to become children of God. We cannot miss that. We cannot miss the importance of that, the very intimacy of a father with his child. John, he reminds us of the nature of the new birth. Those who received him were born, were born of God, not by human effort or achievement, but because they'd seen Jesus for who he was and they ran to him. This idea of receiving Jesus for, for who, he mean, who he is means we embrace him. We receive him unto ourselves. And as, as many as received him, it's just another way of saying who believe in his name. Charles Spurgeon wrote this, faith is described as receiving Jesus. It is the empty cup placed under the flowing stream, the penniless hand held out for heavenly alms. The Apostle Paul wrote in, of this glorious relationship with Jesus in Romans 8, 14 to 17. Those for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit as adoption as sons for whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness of our spirit that we are children of God and of children than heirs and of heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. That is the profound joy to be found in the newborn king born over 2,000 years ago. He came that we might have life and we'd be restored to all that God had created us to be and to do. For just a moment, I want us to just pause and think about that. What it is that God is offering us in Christ. Now you go back and thinking about this is the God who created the heavens and the earth, the universe, and sustains the universe. The God who is not bound by time or space comes and loves you, wants you to know him intimately, wants you to experience him, to hear from him. He wants to bless you for eternity. It's hard to conceive of that. It's hard to measure how God would want to do that. I don't know how you are, but I think of that. I go, why would you love me? Why would you have come for me? Why was my life important to you after all that I did? And I've just felt the warmth and the love of God. And I see the, I see the newborn babe and I realize he did everything the wrong way from our perspective. He did everything that it would take for us to be restored and for us to come to know him. 
And the thing is, he didn't resurrect and go back to being just God. He stayed the God man forever. He is now our mediator. He came to be like that, to be both God and man, and he chose to stay that way for the rest of eternity. What a gift. What an amazing offer. Again, Charles Spurgeon describes the, this change. He said, the man's like a watch, which has a new mainspring, not a mere face and hands repaired, but new inward machinery and freshly adjusted works, which act to a different time and tune. And whereas he went wrong before, now he goes right because he's right within. And that is the joy. That's the reason we come to celebrate Christmas, to remember we have been given the greatest gift of all, We've been given salvation by the eternal God. That's a mystery still. Will you open the gift? Let's pray. Lord, we, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we stand in awe of you. You are far more than we can comprehend. You are far greater than anything we could possibly say about you. And yet, Lord, you came to us in a way that we wouldn't be looking for. You came to us as one of us, and you paid a price for our sins. Lord, we bow before you this morning in thanksgiving. We invite you, Lord, to continue this process of changing us and making us more and more like you. Lord Jesus, it's in your name, the name above every name the name that has the highest honor upon the Father. Amen.